Quartz.net is a powerful job scheduling framework that we have available to us in C Sharp. But of course, with really powerful frameworks, there's a lot of complexity and some best practices we should try to follow. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a principal software engineering manager at Microsoft. In this video, I'm going to walk through a couple of tips that come from the Quartz.net documentation on how to use their framework a little bit more elegantly. I made a previous video, which I'll link up here if you haven't seen it. There's a couple of extra tips there that you can go check out. Again, there's so many ways that you can use Quartz.net, and it's not necessarily an exactly right or wrong thing, but these are some tips that should help you get a little bit more out of the framework in a consistent way. If that sounds interesting, remember to subscribe to the channel and check out that pinned comment for my courses on Dome Train. With that said, let's jump over to Visual Studio and look at some tips for Quartz.net. The first tip that we're going to look at comes right from the documentation and they're talking about the usage of job keys. So job keys are a way that you can give an identity to the job that you want to be able to run in Quartz. And if we look at the components of this job key, we can see that it has a name and the second part of the key is a group. So you have a two part sort of identity for the job. And if we look at triggers, they're actually a very similar type of thing. You can see right here on line 38, this is with identity. This first part is the name and the second part's the trigger. Now to help with some consistency, you'll notice that if I look at line 48 where it says with identity job key, and then on line 39 it says for job and we pass in the job key, and on line 36 I have the job key defined, like we need to have some consistency where we're passing this parameter around because that's the identity for the job that we're referring to. Now, what they suggest doing instead of, uh, I mean, this is already a little bit of an improvement, but instead of doing something like this, where you have this information duplicated in these two spots, because this is prone to having issues if you were to end up saying, oh, I want to rename this, and then you don't rename it in the other spot, we can go a little bit further than having just this variable defined right here. So what they do suggest doing, if we get rid of this job key entirely, they do suggest having a static property, or in this case, a field. That, like, their documentation literally shows a, a public static field. So you could have a job key just like this directly on the type of the job that you're interested in. So if I jump over to the test job that we have, you can see that all that I've done is declared that job key directly on here. One of their pieces of advice, this is of course a really simple example, but they do suggest that you have a static job key on the job type itself. And that way it's very consistent when you want to go to refer to it. You don't need to be trying to redeclare these things or having variables kind of scattered around to go make the job key. And that way, if you want to go change it, hey, look, it's in one spot. So very small tip, but I think if we're taking this kind of concept, you've probably seen this come up in all sorts of different situations in programming. If we have this ability to kind of put some common information in one spot, that can really help try to prevent some bugs in the future, especially because they can be so simple to rename things in the wrong way. The next tip is going to be a little bit more advanced, but it's really just about scheduling jobs in bulk. So if we were to go look at this code that's from line 36 down to uh, 52 here, this is getting a job trigger and a job detail. And then what we're doing here on line uh, 57 and 58 is adding some extra information and then scheduling the job. But if we wanted to go do this in bulk and schedule a whole bunch of these jobs, maybe we had 10 of these jobs we wanted to go run, they don't suggest that you go add them individually with schedule job. They do have a bulk API for that. If I go expand this bit of code here from line 62 down to 84, this is sort of right from their documentation. I've just changed up the uh, individual trigger and job that we're going to be talking about. This is just a brief interruption to remind you that I do have courses available on Dome Train focused on C Sharp. So whether you're interested in getting started in C Sharp, looking for a little bit more of an intermediate course focused on object-oriented programming and some async programming, or are you just looking to update your refactoring skills and see some examples that we can walk through together, you can go ahead and check them out by visiting the links in the description and the comment below. Thanks, and back to the video. So to start things off, what you'll see is on line 60, they have this dictionary that they're going to be using, and the key is the job detail, and then we have a collection of triggers that we can use. If we look inside of this loop, so again, it's going to be making 10 jobs that we're going to trigger, we can see that I'm just using a collection for triggers, and it just has one thing inside of it. So this is just one trigger. I've kind of borrowed it from up top here. It's very similar to this code up top but I've just put it inside of this loop. And what you'll see is I have with identity here, there's going to be some job data. So this is going to be the message from the trigger. In fact, I don't think I want to use it exactly like this because 
Uh, if we watch the previous videos on how we can access job information, the trigger will override the merged properties. And they do suggest that you use the merged properties. So just a quick note that if you have the same key, like I have message here and message here, the trigger one will override. So I want to make sure that when we go to look at that data, we can see which job that we're talking about. Okay, so that's the collection of triggers, and it's just going to be one in this case. It's just one trigger per job, and then you'll notice I'm just creating the job down here. So I create the job, and I say using this data, this is going to be overridden, so technically deleting that would have the same functionality that we'll see in just a moment. But then all I'm doing is adding that job into the dictionary with the collection of triggers, which, as I mentioned, is just one trigger in this example. But that's because it's to meet this API for scheduled jobs. So if you look at the IntelliSense uh, and the tooltip that I have uh, shown here, we can see that the first parameter is an I read only dictionary where the key is a job detail and then the, there's a, the value as a read only collection of triggers. And that's going to be exactly what we defined up here, of course. And these two things, so that's the collection of triggers and this is the job, those meet the value and the key respectively. Now, I'm going to talk about this replace part in just a moment, but I wanted to run this example so that you can see that I am scheduling 10 jobs in bulk. So I'm going to go run this. And if we jump over to the console, I'm just going to scroll a little bit up higher because this ran pretty quick. But we can see that this is going to be the output that comes from our job. And I didn't show it. So if I scroll down to here, you can see all these console right lines. Well, in this case, it's a dependency that I passed in and that all that that does is write to the console. But you can see that I have the first job running, the second one, the third one, right? Like down here, there's three, there's four, and it does it 10 times. That did go schedule 10 jobs and go run them all. And we can see all of that output. You'll notice too that this is all in order. So it's not like the 10th job ran first. It truly ran them in the order that they were scheduled. Okay, so that's a very brief look at the bulk scheduling API. But I just wanted to comment about this replace part because I think if you're moving between this kind of setup where we have a trigger and a job and we're using identities and things like that, there's an easy thing that you might make a mistake doing. And I just wanted to highlight it. So um, if we notice that we have this with identity part, if you instead were to have taken, I'm just going to take this identity here. If we took the same identity, okay, so this trigger is now the exact same. I want to talk about this replace parameter that's down here, because what will happen if the key for the trigger is the same, it's going to replace it. So just to show you what I mean by that, if I go run this, you'll notice that we only see the 10th job, right? So instead of having all of that information printed out, all that I did was I changed the identity of the trigger and it's going to be the same trigger identity for each loop. And that means that every time we go to add one of these in to the dictionary, it's going to be identified the same way. As a result, this replace parameter, what that's doing is saying, hey, look, if you come across the same key, we're just going to overwrite what's there. So we end up only getting the last trigger firing here. So I just wanted to mention that to you because if that's not what you're expecting, you either need to give it a unique identity or toggle this replace part. So let's go stop this. If you end up putting this down to false here, this is going to try and protect you from having the same identity as well. So just to show you, if you go run this now, again, we're going to have 10 iterations of this, every single one with the same trigger name. And we're saying not to replace, it's going to protect you. And I mean, an exception doesn't really feel like protection, but what I mean by protecting you is that it's not going to allow you to schedule the same thing 10 times if that's not what you were expecting to do. So you do want to consider giving it a unique name for the identity up here, which is why in this case, I just gave it one like this. I would consider this replace part being like a safety mechanism, right? So the way you set up your code, if you were allowing a bunch of triggers to come in from different sources and maybe not defining them exactly in one spot like this, you may want to be able to have protection and say, hey, look, if anyone passes me the same trigger identity, we either don't want to allow that or with replace being true, you're saying that's totally acceptable. I'm just going to take the last one that comes into here and that will be the trigger that gets fired. So just different use cases and you can pick and choose what you want to use there. But that is going to be the scheduled jobs in bulk API. And the main idea there is that instead of calling scheduled job, like we see on line 58, 10 times, we can actually go create this dictionary and go do it in bulk. So those are just some quick tips that we can use with Quartz.net based on their documentation for some best practices that they want you to try and leverage. Now, if you thought that was interesting, you can check out this video next for some job listeners and other cool stuff. 
Thanks, and I'll see you next time.